Welcome back to the ninth episode of the CEO Journey podcast. Today, we are joined by none other than the serial entrepreneur, best-selling author, and highly influential financial markets activist, Clem Chambers. Clem, thank you very much for hopping on the podcast today. Really appreciate it. Um, first of all, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing, in fact, very, very great. I'm, I'm on a beginning of a whole set of new entrepreneurial journeys, as, as young people like to put it. I start in lots of new businesses. You know what I mean, mate? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, no, a lot of people know you for your work in the financial market space, but also as a key business magnate. Um, so to the viewers who might not know you out there, could you just briefly introduce yourself and currently state where you are? No, I'm not sure about brief. I mean, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, so my ego's that big. And therefore, I really need to kind of give you 45 minutes or I'm such an amazing person. But in a short form, I started in computer games when I was about 18, 17 or 18, um, when I was too young to realise that it was a, not a very smart thing to do. Turned out it's quite a good thing to do in the very early 80s. Um, I then went on and I started to do stuff online I with modems, you know, the things that used to go like that. Um, and nobody had heard of it back then and Prestel and all that sort of stuff. You know, it was it was very, very early days did some of the very, very, very earliest uh, multiplayer games, massively multiplayer games, MMO Pogs or whatever they're called these days. The, the very initial ones of those, I was part of, of that set of pioneers. Um, and then went on to found ADBFN, which is a very big financial website, um, particularly in the UK, in the US. And then now I'm out um, building up some new businesses from scratch. Um, because th that was the thing that came to an end after 20 years. <laughs> and so I'm now fat, old and stupid and starting more new businesses. Well, no, thank you for that introduction. And it's um, super interesting to hear how far you've come. Um, but I guess the centre point of my curiosity really um, lies with your earlier life and career. And what I'd love to understand is, you know, when and how did your entrepreneurial spark first develop? Well, I think my entrepreneurial spark started very, 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 very early because when I was a little kid, I think I was probably about seven, my father said to me, well, of course, if you ever want any new toys, not that I was short of money to buy my own, but if you ever want any new toys, why don't you just sell your old ones? And I thought, that's quite a good idea. So he gave me a roll of price things. And so I, I took out all these old toys from my cupboard um, and my brother's cupboard, but they were mine. And I laid them out on the tabletop. And I put stickers on it, sixpence, shilling, all that sort of stuff. And I went around and told all my friends to come around the house and with their money and buy my stuff. And lo and behold, miraculously, they showed up with money in their hands. And they literally hold out their money and go, oh, I want that one. And I go, really? Oh, ah. And it was such a kick to actually have an event where your friends really wanted to buy those toys. And really wanted to give you money to take them. So there was pleasure at their end and pleasure at my end. I just, from that moment on, I just loved the idea of transacting in a way where people wanted what I had to sell and gave me money. I mean, it's a buzz when somebody gives you, doesn't matter whether, even today, if someone gives me a, a dollar, and it does happen, honestly, it happens. Mm. I like that dollar. I, that's that's the buzz. The pleasure I get from somebody buying something off me for 10 bucks, like one of my books, for example, is way, way more than the 10 bucks I get. It's just such a buzz to be you know, validated like that, to have invented, created, made something. And then someone say, here's some money for that thing that you've made. That kind of validation. I just love that. And when, you know, people go around and say, well, you know, I'm an artist. You say, oh, really? When was the last time you painted anything? And they go... Well, not for a few years. I said, oh, really? Did you sell many when you were painting them? Well, not really. No, I'm a misunderstood artist. Or I'm an author. Oh, you've written a book. Yes. Is it out there? No. You know, see, I don't rate that. No. I rate, I don't care what it is. Look, if I have a horse and that horse leaves 10 kilos of, of poo behind and I put it in a bag and I put it outside my door and say, rose fertilizers, five pounds. And someone comes along and gives me five pounds for a bag of horse poo. That's great, isn't it? Yeah. That's great. I've, think, I've turned poo into, into some resources. I've mapped somebody's need for rose fertilizer with my need to get rid of piles of poo out of my, my, my stable. I mean, that's fab, isn't it? I love yeah. that. 
no, that's that's great. So was it that validation and that kick that you got from? Um... Well, it, it was a kick. It's always been a kick. When yeah. when I was a child of about twelve, my mother had a tobacconist in Narford. Right. She did up a tobacconist. And these little right. old guys used to come in and go, "Can I have ten John Player special, please?" And I would serve there, and they'd say it to me, and I would go turn around and I'd take out the wood vines or whatever it was, and they'd, they'd give me a pound, and I would say. 59, 60, 70, 80, 90, one pound. And I put it in a bag and I'd wrap it properly and I'd hand it to them. That's just great. I love that. I absolutely love that. And, you know, so I've always got a kick out of a transaction when somebody wants what I have and I can serve them well and give them what they want and later on what they need and often what they what they don't know they need until they've got it. That's, you know, that's the best. That's the is, best. is that the main principle that you use to run your businesses now? Well, I've, I've always been more interested in what I can sell. Yeah. Yeah. So you go, well, what, 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 is, what is it I can sell? And you think, well, what, what do people want? What are people asking for? But you might think, well, what is something that when they look at it, they go, I've got to have that. Yeah. In the computer game business, you'd go, well, what are people going to want to buy? So it might be a cricket game. It might be a game that came through the letterbox and that you thought was really good. So how do I package it to make them want to buy it? To make them actually play the game and 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 take forward way back in the day then you get into products that you know are great and you know are brilliant but you know that the market doesn't know about it doesn't want to know about it isn't interested yeah. in it but if only you can push them over the lip into actually understanding what you've got to offer they will then go wow that's great and they'll buy it so then you get into an inventing marketing dynamic which yeah. comes later you know because yeah. you're not buying somebody's and lemons to make lemonade to make a lemonade store you're kind of inventing a new kind of vodka you know golden or whatever there's something yeah. i've always found i've got totally into something I've got, this is amazing this is fantastic online games for example it's amazing it's brilliant and why do people spend a lot of money on it how do i take that how do i connect with the creation of that and then how do i get it to market and how do i maximize the people that come to that product and at the end of the day no one's if, if you're not some kind of sinister, manipulative criminal, mm. i.e. the sort of people that try to make products that people get addicted to and it's nasty and, and that they can take to the cleaners, you know, like like for example. If you're not on, on the dark side, you're yeah. trying to make a wonderful product that people love and therefore, you, you know, you love it and therefore you want to improve it, you want to design it better, you want to make it more fun for yourself and then you hope being custom one, that other people will go, oh, that's great. That's brilliant. I love that. Oh, I'll, I'll buy some of that. I'll tell my friends. Yeah. No. And so was the um, game development company your first venture? Uh, well, it was it was more of a game publisher than a game development company. It became right. okay. a game development company because pretty soon you want to commission your own stuff and pretty soon you want to get people in-house to do it. So, I mean, this is back in the day. And this is this is just as the Spectrum came out, before, in fact, Spectrum. Now, right when i started off so most people don't even know what that is i mean you put that spectrum mm. what's a spectrum you know home computers were rubber keyboards back in 1983 mm -hmm. you know, yeah i mean it's, it's it's not even a generation ago it's like two generations ago and i was um what, 17 wow and and you know i was trying to get going in business because you know i thought they didn't let me to university because i'm a little bit dyslexic and um, so I thought, well, you know, start a business and see how you go. And and you just follow the um, follow the path, right? You just you just go out there and you try to make something. Yeah. And and you and you fail, you fail, you fail, you fail, and then you get a win, and then you bank it. And that win was computer games when they're just starting. I mean, literally, you know, there was a small rack that big in W. H. Smith's of cassettes for the Velix eighty one. Yeah, Sinclair's first machine or second machine, and you know it was it was the beginning. So you are, if you've got a bit of luck, entering into an opportunity where there's a vacuum. Yeah, and therefore you know there's there's six other people trying to do it, and none of them have a clue, and you don't have a clue. Mm. But you know there's demand for the product, and therefore you will invent that industry. And me and another sort of I don't know hundred people invented the British computer game industry. Wow. And and you know had a thoroughly horrible, miserable time because it was a time when you had to do it on nothing. You had yeah. to 
you know, had to, you had no capital, the banks wouldn't lend you any money. Um, you know, nobody knew what it was that we were doing. Nobody understood how to package it. Nobody done that. Nobody done any of it. It was all pure invention, which is, you know, it's 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 stressful. Did you find it difficult for people to take you seriously at such a young age? Well, I didn't realise at the time, um, but yes. I, I mean, people people would take me seriously, but they 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 hate me. They go, yeah. I hate that kid. That <laughs> bloody kid, I hate him. You see, yeah. I've been working at a company since I left university, and I'm 35, and I've got kids and a mortgage and a wife, <laughs> and I put my part of my anatomy, which is quite painful, on the anvil here, and this little <laughs> punk's come along, and he, he knows it all, he knows everything. He's, yeah. he's a native for what I'm trying to do, and there he is. He's, he's got pimples. I mean, what the hell? He wasn't in, in my year at school when I was at school. He wasn't practically born. He was six. You know, and there's definitely a thing about people get on with their own age um, yeah. cohort. Mm. And I wasn't in that age cohort. I was, I was, you know, 10 years, maybe maybe 15 to 20 years younger than all those people who really were going out on a limb because they had, you know, they had plenty to lose. Because they were leaving businesses to go into their own. And I was leaving school. I'd left school. I mean, you know, wouldn't let me into university. So I, I, you know, I had, I had nothing to lose. I, I mean, I didn't feel like that. But I mean, really, you know, I was, I was free as a bird. And um, so there, they, uh, they, uh, they were unsettled. Found it difficult to, to, to kind of, you know, yeah, you know, go down the pub and, and you know, get drunk and do all that stuff and socialize because, you know, I was like, oh, I'll have a couple of cola bars. <laughs> yeah. um, I remember our printer said, you know, he offered me his, uh, you know, one of his, um, I think it was Benson Hedges in the day, uh, offered me a Benson Hedges. He said, oh, no, I don't smoke. Oh, oh, shit, don't smoke. Oh, shit, what do you have to drink then? I said, oh, I'll, I'll have a Coca Cola, please. And he said, oh, you don't want a part of beer or, you know, have a, a whiskey chaser. I said, oh, oh, no, I don't really like to drink, really. He said, you don't smoke, you don't drink. You must fornicate a lot. <laughs> That's a joke, by the way, but it's true. It's a true story. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, so you can imagine a 17, 18, 19-year-old. I mean, I was an veteran by the time I was 19, going, mixing with all these, you know, on the edge of middle age. So, yeah, it, it is it, – I don't know what you mean by taking seriously, because if you've got a product, they'll buy it. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you've got something that people want to buy – and, and you've got a, a way in which they can buy it within the terms of their business, yeah. and it's good old-fashioned straight business that you're doing, then they'll buy it, and there's no problems. But essentially, yeah, what I was meaning was, like, for example, me and Joe with the podcast, and then we've got another venture. We're obviously quite young. We're 19 years old. And a lot of the time, people just, you know, completely disregard you because of your age. Um, so no, they're, know, just, they're just wasters. Yeah. The world's full of wasters. There's worlds full of people that want an appointment to have an appointment to have an appointment. Oh, I'll, be, I'll be ready in two weeks' time on a Wednesday. Yeah. I'll get my secretary to call you and all that nonsense. Yeah. They're just they're just lazy people that don't want to put in any effort. No, hundred percent. Or or they're not that bright, or they're you know, or they or they're just lazy and tired, or the world is full of wasters. Yeah. I mean, is people who make stuff happen would make a lot more happen if all the Dead weight and get out of the blooming way. Yeah. And you can see that everywhere you go, it's just dead weight. Oh, no. Chris, I know. <laughs> oh, I, I want to change my address. Oh, we've, 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 um, we've, we've, we put your account on pause. I just want to change the address. Oh, can you send me some documents? Send you some documents. Oh, can you send them again? Oh, this one's, this one's less than more than 90 days old. No, it's not. Time wasted, oh, isn't it? And you, you get that everywhere you turn. In fact, if you go somewhere and you go click, 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 and you get what they say that they're going to give you, when they say you're going to give it, for the price they say you're going to give it to you, go, oh, hallelujah, what went right? Yeah. Yeah. So for people that try to make stuff happen, like you, you'll come up against dead weight all the time. Yeah. What can I interview you? Who the hell are you then? Well, somebody that's, that wants to talk to you about how marvelous you are is going to put you out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> can you send written questions to you? Or rather, you've just got to disregard all of that, haven't you? And just focus on your own. Focus on. Well, your no own. one's going to give you anything out there. Yeah. Like you don't. It's not that you've got to take it. You've just got to make it. You've just got to. You know, you've got to do the the mileage. You're a salesperson. 
you want somebody like me to come on your show and talk to you. You prefer to have Elon Musk, but he won't answer his phone, right? So you go around, you do the miles, and I go, oh, I'll do that. What, well, aren't you too busy to do that? Ah, oh, never too busy to do that. If I'm busy, I'm not doing my job wrong, mm. right? It's like, I've got stuff. You do stuff efficiently, you've got all your time your own. If you have to sweep the streets, you're busy sweeping the streets. So, you know, busy is not necessarily efficient. But in fact, it's the opposite, right? People make work so they can keep yeah. employed. You see that every, all the time. Yeah. But if you do your, your job properly, you have plenty of time. You yeah. can always make time. It's whether you want to make time or not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, and would you say having that, because obviously you've got like a very, um, you'll take opportunities and you'll put yourself out there and I'm guessing you've had that characteristic since a young age would you say that's been really pivot pivotal for you um throughout your career and your I, success? The, the pivotal part is never giving up and never giving in right yeah and 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 also I think see I, I I'm not Hindu but I believe in karma and I believe karma is basically the wake that you leave behind you right yeah. So, you know, everybody can see the weight that, that you leave behind you pretty much. It doesn't yeah. you don't need to be a genius. You know, your your history is marked on your face. Yeah. Yeah. And every you know, what you've done around you is pretty clear. People are really, really smart at knowing whether, you know, you're you're safe or dangerous. Yeah. So you you've got to yeah. have a good ethical core for if you're going to be in business for the long term. And, and that is really, really important. It, it's under undervalued and underestimated. But ultimately, I think it, that's what tells. There's a lot of people that come and go. Yeah. There's a lot of people that soon enough are floating below in the river under the bridge you're standing. Yeah. yeah and they come in, they slash and burn, and they fail. It, business is always full of that. So really, you've got to, to, to plan a pretty straight course, and you've got to be simple, straightforward, um, know what you want, know how you're going to get it, be straight with people, and and you'll be fine. But you can't give up, and you can't give in, and you've got to be prepared to to take it, um, you know, to be bashed around the head pretty pretty often, particularly when you start out, and you've got, you've got no um, equity, you've got no money, and you probably haven't got your skill up to, to a much of a high level. You don't know what you're doing. But it's still actually the, the only person that's going to get in your way is yourself. Yeah. Yeah, no. And um, did you have that plan with CRL, the game publishing company? Well, CRL was that computer game business. And, and you know, I, I tried to get going with a couple of things and they just didn't go. It was just like, you know, clunk, clunk, clunk. And when I started, um, I put a tiny little advert in a tiny little magazine saying, have you written a computer game? And so I sent it to me. And boom, I got a post back. Yeah. And, and a lot of it was really good. So, you know, I, I went... Um, you know, I packaged it and I manufactured it and I sold it. And you just have to, you know, you just have to do it. And it doesn't matter if you do it badly. I mean, I used to remember I, I would I would design, say, like six um, covers, cassette covers with games. Yep. And and they'd arrive from the printer. And, and printers were in those days very unreliable on, on pretty much every possible dimension you can imagine. And you'd go, oh, is, oh, that one's good. That works. Oh, he's messed up the lettering and I can't read it properly. Oh, no, what are we going to do about that? Oh, oh it's all right, I suppose. And you go through them, and, and out of six, you get three really good ones, two which are okay, and one which is terrible. But you still have to release the game. It's yeah. still a terrible cover. And, you know, all, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Yeah. So you have to plan for that. You have to plan for it taking much longer. You have to, I mean, the thing that over the years always irritates me desperately is what they call Tina now. Right, okay. Which is, which is there is no alternative. Right. So someone says, oh, we're going to sell 50,000 of this game. And you go, well, what happens if you only sell 7,000? So that's the normal number. They go, oh, no there's, no, there's no alternative. We will do it. If we don't, we'll go bust. So we'll go bust then, won't you? Oh, no, 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 no. There's, there's, there's no alternative. We, there's the only, only way ahead is success yeah. and winning and victory. There's, there's, there's no plan B. We don't need a plan B. Burn our boats. Here we go, fifty thousand, and, and, and <laughs> oh, yeah. away they go, and they and they and they die. You've got to always be prepared, uh, or as much as possible for the worst, but not let that stop you. So it's about having the backup plan then as well. The not plan. necessarily, but just plan for things that might go wrong. So you awesome. imagine this could happen. 
So rather than getting it on Friday, we're going to get it on Wednesday. And if it comes on Wednesday, what are we going to do? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, well, when it comes on Wednesday, what you've got to do is you've got to pull a three-night packing shift. Mm. You personally, and maybe you're going to go on holiday on Friday. Mm. But you don't go on holiday. Yeah. You do the three-day packing shift. Yeah. And you catch for your holiday. You don't go. Even yeah. though your girlfriend's saying, oh, my oh, I've got the suntan lotion. You just tough luck. You've got to you've got to do that. Yeah. And you know, the it has to be done and you have to do what's necessary to get it done. That's what I mean by never giving up and never giving in. You just yeah. got to do it. You can't go. I mean, I I, I was helping this guy um, who was a book publisher guy, and he he did he was a wonderful book publishing guy, but he was going bust right. because he wasn't selling thirty thousand of his book, he was selling twenty thousand of his book. Right. Maybe he wasn't spending two pounds on a copy, he's spending two pounds thirty a copy. So he's in a bit of a pickle. And I was trying to help him raise some money. Okay. And then he was, you know, literally days away from going out, going out of business. Any small business person will know the feeling of yeah, I've got about 10 days to do this, so I'm gonna go bust. Yeah. Which means about three weeks after you're gonna go bust, you go bust, unless you pull that thing off you need to do so you sell it. You can always push that out. Mm. A certain amount but anyway he had he was right at the end of that and he said oh i'm going away i'm going skiing oh my god <laughs> uh, d- d- what yeah. <laughs> i'm going skiing but you're going skiing what for the weekend i mean you, you know you, 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 no two weeks but be, you're gonna go bust in two weeks oh dear <laughs> and you're going skiing oh yes well it's been flat for a long time well, obviously, going, you're going bus has been planned for a long time. I said, but how can you even afford to go skiing when you need money for your business? Yeah. You should be saving that money and, you know, paying off the guys that are going to take your photocopier away when they come to your door or something. Mm-hmm. And he goes, oh, well, no. It's, oh, God. And I tell you, the amount of times I've seen business people go on holiday just before they go bust, I can't tell you the time, half a dozen times. Mm-hmm. And you go, how yeah you know so not giving up not giving in and be being prepared to do what's necessary to stay afloat for a small business person is, is, is incredibly important because for the early stages you're just not going to have the capital you're going to have to be doing some mighty bootstrap yeah to, to to get where you need to go because you know even this day of unicorns and things and all that all that semi fantasy you read in all the press about how you can fund your business blah 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 mm. um you know it, it's it's most for most people they're doing it on on a prayer and you absolutely cannot falter mm. no yeah 100 and um to bring it a bit forward how did you find your passion for the financial markets and where did that come about well again it comes from an early age uh, my, my father was a, was a was a um, commodity speculator, trader, okay. dealer, um, and he always used to just let us. He had this little extension on the telephone. And he said, "Well, if you want to hear what I'm saying, just pick that up and just listen to it. It's got no mouthpiece on it, so so you can hear what's going on." If you want to. Mm. And so he used to do that, and and that was interesting. And you know, he read the FT and we read the FT, and and it was it was just generally interesting, but. Um, when um, we we got to do ADBFN, when I started ADBFN, yeah. I thought, well, you can do this um, one or two ways. Well, I didn't think of that at all. I thought the only way to do this is to take all your money and put it in the in the stock market, and then you'll have skin in the game. I, I consider it a different part of my anatomy, um, you know, on on the anvil, and and it will cause you to create um, the site in a way whereby you can actually use that capital in the market and um, to the best use as a private investor on the outside. Right. I can build a, a set of tools which will um, enable me to use that money that I put into the market at risk. And and that will be a, a virtual circle. And, and so it turned out because, you know, you've got to be all in if you're going to go into business. Yeah. You've got to be all in. And, and you see so many people that are not all in in business. And, very few of them succeed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, with ADFM, ADVFM, sorry, um, you said about, so So was it a business, an accidental business, as in did you create it to help yourself initially and then did it transpire into a... Well, the way that it turned out, it's, it's a very strange um, road because I started this multiplayer game company called Off. And 
I mean, nobody had heard of that at the time. And we went on and mm. on. And in 1991, we went and we IPO'd on the A market. I think uh, we're um, online, which is now on my blockchain, is like the 23rd oldest A listed company. And, you know, every, no one had heard of us at all. And and the city of London wanted us like they wanted a, an Astra on a motorbike. And so there we were, floated, we raised the, the bare minimum. And, and we became an incubator. So we incubated. And, and then the internet thing exploded. And we were the first company to go from tuppence to 15 pounds and all that crazy dot com stuff. And we raised a bit of money on the back of that. And we started incubating these internet companies. And one of them was ADVFN. And then we floated that. Right. And um, that went public. It came out 10p, maybe it went to 50p. So it went from 25 million to 150 million, all, all that good crazy dot com stuff. But we did that on a blue sky idea, okay. raised money, and then we delivered the project. Because okay. a lot of people in that circumstance, they took, they they sell a big story. Oh, you know, um, anti gravity machine, blah blah blah, mm. uh, and then they don't do it. Mm. They just they just take the money and you know pay themselves salaries for two or three years and say, oh, sorry, it didn't work. But as we come from from software development and making products. Mm. We were able to to create um, ADVFN from a part of capital that was listed on, on the A market, and we built that. You know, it took us well. We never never really stopped and um, developing it one way or the other. Way. And you know, 22 years later, I said goodbye, or it's a goodbye to me, depending on which way you want to want to play that. Um, in February, so now I'm off. Um, I'm you know cracking the handle again and see what will come out of the um, out of the idea machine. Yeah, did you you started it in two thousand two? Idea EBFN. Oh, nineteen ninety nineteen ninety nine. It's such a long time ago, you know. It doesn't seem that long, but my memory's not so great. I think we floated in nineteen ninety at the end of nineteen ninety nine or beginning of two thousand. One right. or two. But online, um, which is now online blockchain, which is which does crypto, you yeah. see, from incubating internet to web three. Um, I think that's nineteen ninety seven. Right, okay. okay, and um, like especially with the dot com crash, um, before you were born, lad. Before you yeah. were born, no, yeah, I was born in 2003, so a day uh, makes it long, yeah, exactly. Um, but what challenges did you face, particularly during that time, and how did you overcome those? Challenges? Well, I mean, obviously, the dot com and boom became the dot com crash, yeah, and therefore you had to do it on the money that you had. And obviously, if you've got a financial website when everybody doesn't like shares anymore, that's pretty true. Yeah. And they're just all just all the the typical stuff that you have to put up with the business, which is just, you know, one thing going right and three things going wrong. And you know, trying to keep um on the on the path down the middle. You know, yeah. if you think about it, thousands of companies have, have come and gone on the A market, arrived and gone bust. Yeah. And we there we've been there, you know, grinding away at it. Not that it became a huge company, not that it became a Google or anything, you know, but it survived so that it became the 23rd oldest is right now, probably even less companies, 23rd oldest company on AIM. So you could say what it was good at and what I was good at was survival in, in that environment, which is very harsh, actually, very, very harsh to be aimed this time. Yeah, because I... I and on the stock market tool for that. No, yeah, because I was reading that... Um... ADVFM was at one point deemed a dot com failure, and then you obviously uh, transformed it into a market leader. Um, well, it's always a market leader. You see, it, it's like saying a dot com failure is like yeah. saying the dot com failed, which it did. It failed massively because there was like five, uh, two thousand companies um, in the dot com, mm. and now there's only five left. Yeah, and they're all the biggest companies in the world. Yeah, <laughs> but you know. For the for the for the Amazons and the Apples, for that matter, and for all the other guys that Facebooks and all that, they came out of that huge um, wave, yeah. and and it was it was you know financial carnage for many of them. Yeah, uh, and that's just the way it is. I mean, it is very very tough to build a business, and it's you know survival is what most of them don't do. So even if you're still hanging on the edge of the cliff or whatever. Um, that's a that's that's an amazing achievement. I feel all right. You don't become Jeff Bezos, you you don't become Elon Musk and all that stuff. But nonetheless, when you think of of the ones that 
that disappear. Yeah. No one ever remembers them. Survivor bias is, is is quite important in a way. Survival is you know is 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 a achievement in its own right. Mm. Yeah. No, hundred. That's my excuse anyway for not being Jeff Bezos. So yeah, no, hundred percent. But uh... I've got more hair than he has, just like you have. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully I won't be losing mine. I wonder how big a chicken you'd write for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably a lot. Um, uh, but you had a founding team with ADVFN, didn't you? Yeah, it's all about, well, for me, it's always about team. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know quite a lot of people that are basically sole um, proprietors. And, yeah. and it's all for them and, and, you know, all for one and one for one. Uh, and... Um, that's not the way I am. I, I like to be in team because you know you can bring different skills to the table, and and I, I guess I like other people to do really well. If you look at Silicon Valley, there's a lot of that going on there because yeah. if you look at the big companies, they pay their top people like like gods, and I I agree to that. In the UK, there's this penny pinching attitude that you know you just you just workers. What do you mean? You're in you're in the you're in the mid quartile of, of of what you get paid for that stuff. Be happy, and you know, a sort of chiselling, ungenerous attitude, and uh, I, I think that's old way of thinking. I mean, I was only thinking today about people over the, the years who go, so who's your competition? And I'd always go, we don't have any. And see, there must be a competition. So well, there is, but it's like Kim Kardashian. She's our competition because she's she takes attention from us, and she takes more attention than anybody else at the moment. Yeah. So it's her. Yeah, you know, because all we want is people's um, attention. And people go, but you've got lots of competition. You know, what about blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And we go, well, actually, they expand our market. Because mm. they're going out. They're not fighting us. Mm. I mean, they might have a competing product or something similar or something in the area. But more than anything, they're going out there to get people interested in what we do. Yeah. And we think we're better. So if they get some customers, soon enough, that customer's going to come to us. So they're, they're, they're not. They're a positive benefit to us. Yeah, so and, clearly, you know, that's how we feel about things. Yeah, yeah. and is it that confidence that's really like served you well? Because obviously you're very. Well, I don't. I, is it confidence? Is it arrogance? Is is it just the way that it really is? Yeah. I mean, you know, you, I, I, there's there's no need to be negative about stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you 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 accentuate the positive. Mm. Eliminate the negative and don't mess with Mr. Inventor. That's a song, but and it's a good good set of rules, really. I mean, if anything, you have to protect your rear from accidents mm. and, and and the sort of crazy random bad things and the sort of things that happen because companies are, are, are poor. You know, like like the bank that brings you up and wants to close down your account because compare us like hard. You know, it's like what. You want the, so you have to make sure you've got more than one bank and, and stuff. I, I was hearing a story about a, a FTSE 100 company that mm. had their bank account shut down on them because the computer said no in some offshore place where they did insurance. So they, they literally rang up one of the, the top 20 um, FTSE listed FDs and said, oh, we're closing your bank account. Wow. It's like you couldn't make it up. But <laughs> in this modern era of management by spreadsheet, yeah. That sort of things happens, and yeah. you know, I, I think that's also not a very good development over the last few years. Is the the management by optimization is mm. is a very slippery slope. Often, right? oh, we're going to charge them more because we know they will pay more because we've been looking at the statistics. So we're going to be unfair. We're going to rip them off because we know they've got a problem, and therefore we're going to bill accordingly. Mm. Is that is that is well, that's what the airlines do, right? Mm. So, is that right? That you should take advantage of people because you you know that they've got a problem and therefore you need an them. Can't be right, can it? No, no. And all that, I mean, what's it called? Um, pricing. That's that's variable pricing and um, flexible pricing. So mm. that you price in a way to optimize, i.e., exploit your customer. Mm. It's a lot of that going on, and and that's new. That's mm. new. Dynamic pricing, there you go. That's the technical term for it. And yeah. um, you know, the line between optimizing what you do and and taking advantage of people. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you just say, "Oh, spreadsheet," "Oh, it's a spreadsheet," says that. Oh, it's the algo. You know, it's the algo. Oh, yes. yeah. 
yeah, we killed seven people, but it's the algo. Mm. You know, I think I think that's that's a that's a bad trend out there. But you know, but it's if those sort of little things, those little risks that you need to 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 be careful and watch if you're in business because they can come bite you pretty hard if you don't imagine that they might be there if you don't preempt them mm. if you don't think about what yeah. can go wrong yeah no and what was the reason for taking the company public was it just for fine raising finance or was it it's a, being public is a mixed bag mm. yeah one of one of the things that it's good at is that you have access to cash right so you can go out and you can get people to write checks and and that can be extremely useful and in, in fact vital in fact in a funny way um, my previous company hadn't done that since 2006. I hadn't done it for 15 years. Right. And in a sense, that's almost like not the game. Your yeah. Part of the game is to, to raise money. Uh, and to an extent, if you don't, uh, it, it's one of those complicated balances that you get in the public space. And, and it's the fact that you can get people to write your big checks yeah. when you ask them um, sometimes. That is very, 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 very useful. And it, it, it makes up for a lot of the trouble, cost, and pain of right. being publicly listed. Of course, it, it feels good when you do it the first time. Because you're like, oh, I'm the CEO of a public yeah. company listed on the stock market. Yeah. It's quite a nice statement, isn't it? It feels it feels good, but it actually nobody cares. And no, no, it does it it's a afterglow that lasts about a week. And then you it's no, it's not it's not like no, it, it it's really yeah, it's one of those things. Once you've done it, you find out it's not such a big and um, hairy deal, really. But it's aspirational for a lot of people, and right. I suppose it was aspirational for me, um, in a way, because you feel like that's the ultimate um, place to get. Um, and then when you got there, you find out that it's you know, not such a big deal. If an entrepreneur, it's not a big deal at all, actually. It, it, yeah, well, if an entrepreneur is like, if an entrepreneur came up to him and was like, "Oh, well, I'm thinking about taking my company public," would you? advise them to or would you well i'll say why you want to do that yeah i mean if they say well you know it's always been an ambition of mine mm. i'd say get another one mm. if, if they said well i want to actually sell my business mm. and you know a chunk of it uh, and i want to raise capital because I, I think we can go a lot bigger right. then i say, oh fair enough um but you know you realize that you're going to have a pretty um hard road on that yeah um but you know if they said well like, you know i, I I've got a business that's worth 100 million. I fancy 10 when I buy myself a swimming pool and I'll put 10 into the business because I, I want to build a factory. Right. I don't want to borrow money from, from banks when the interest rates are going crazy. Then I'd say, yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. Or, you know, I want to sell 10% of the business now for a swimming pool and then I want to come back three years' time and sell another 30% because yeah. I want to buy a swimming pool, a bigger one, and then I'll, I'll sell the rest to someone else at the end of that process. Or maybe someone come along and buy me out entirely. That's good, but uh, or I've got this great idea and I've done it small and now I want to go big really fast and I, and I want to have the capital and not borrow it. There's all sorts of reasons to do it and there's quite a few reasons not to do it and well, it's not an easy road. What about publicity? Does it attract a lot of good publicity or? Well, I mean, don't you just run down the road naked these days? I mean, <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways of doing it, isn't there? Who 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 knows? More than five percent of listed companies mm. in London. Mm. If if you're you know if you if you if you do um, Zoomic PLC or name, no one's going to have heard of it. No. Nobody cares. No, exactly. I mean, I think uh, it's a good thing to realise. Nobody cares. I mean, the the modern uh, you know famous celebrity troll is is proof of that. The amount of noise they generate just appears a blip on the radar. Yeah, I mean, outweighs what anything a, a businessman can do. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And if we look at the success of ADVFN, and um, I think I read that it had a 36 million user base at one time. Oh, yeah, huge, huge, huge. Yeah, absolutely huge. How do you attract such a vast user base then? Well, have something that people want to come back and use again. Yeah. Is there a I strategy mean, to it, though? Well, I mean, yes, because you've got to keep... I mean, look, I, I've got this problem with the word strategy, mm. okay? Because I meet people and I say, what are you doing? They say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm head of strategy. I say, really? Well, how you do... What, what's the strategy? Mm. And they go, 
what's a strategy? Yeah, what's a, your head of strategy? Tell, tell me what's the definition of a strategy. Mm. And they go, well, it's a plan. Mm. And you see, so a strategic plan is a plan plan, isn't it? Mm. And, you know, strategy, what does it mean? What does strategy mean? Strategy means a long-term plan. Strategy is long term. That's all it means, right? So it's something you got to keep doing and keep doing and keep doing. A tactic is something you do in the short term. I'm going to ring up Fred and tell him to go to work. That's a that's a tactic. Yeah, a strategy is to have the department of bringing up people like Fred and tell them to go to work for the next five years. Yeah. So a strategy is something, and everyone thinks it's all complicated, but you get them to define it. But if you try to boil it down, strategy means it's a long term, big picture thing. Mm. So long-term big picture for us or for anybody should be to create a product that people want to come back to because it's great. Yeah. That's it. And you that's know, how you take it. That, that, that's what I've always tried to do my whole life. And of course, yeah. it's actually not that difficult if you're really, really engaged with your product. But if you're the sort of person, I mean, I went into a restaurant um, a few nights ago, and it just didn't come to the table. Yeah. And then it was like, you know, oh no, I've got to write out the menu. What they meant was bugger off, so we can shut up early because <laughs> it wasn't the owner, right? <laughs> Heaven knows what that food would have been like. Yeah. So you've got to be into your product. You've got to, you know, if you want to run a restaurant, be the chef that loves to make great food. You'll yeah. be packed. You know, being a, a, a waitress that wants to, you know, make everybody happy at the table. There's a restaurant in London called Anglo. I'm not sponsored by them, but they might. <laughs> called Anglo, and it's it's up by um, Cat and Garden. No. I think it's a chef in the back and a, and, a, and a lady that serves. Fantastic food. Amazing, amazing. And you can tell that maybe there's someone else to wash plates from Cat in the back. There's only two or three of them in there, and they're totally into what they're doing. They're totally into the food. They're totally into their restaurant. And therefore, it makes it somewhere you want to go. Yeah. If you haven't got that commitment to your product, you're going to fail, I think. So many people, they're not into their product. And because they yeah, never invented it in the first place, they've, they've got better things to do than make sure the product's excellent and the service is excellent. And yeah. therefore, they, you know, it's very hard for them to succeed. So is what you're saying, like the passion, the passion, you used to have a lot of passion for... Well, I mean, you see, there's this new new vocabulary of business that people like you use, like, on the journey. Yeah. And it's like, passion. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that passion, that's a very nebulous word. Commitment. Commitment, right. Okay. Commitment, commitment, commitment. And, you know, it does help to be enthusiastic. Yeah? And if you can't be totally into your product or some people say OCD you know you can't be absolutely totally into your product how's it going to be any good or how are some people that are good at the product really how do you know that they're any good at it you know it's like it's always oh I like to have a hundred thousand pound foot view of these things really well that's not what the view of your customers having is it mm. they're having it right in their face yeah a computer say no <laughs> And the, and the cancel my account button doesn't cancel my account. I was having this trouble with, with Coinbase. Right. I tried to change my address. I put vast amounts of crypto through that. I tried to change my address. Oh, we've blown up our system. Arr, system under review. Uh, email, email, email. Oh, we've, clo we've, we've closed this issue. It's sold. No, it's not. Oh, over and over and over again. So I go by six months. And I, go, I should just shut that account. I don't know why, you know, I'm hanging around. I go to it. Shut the account. Yeah. Does it shut? No. Go back. Shut the account. No. Shut the account. No. Go onto Twitter. Shut my account, will you? The scammers got to me faster. Well, the scammers immediately are, are saying, like, oh, come here. Through this form. Yeah, 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 yeah. Immediately doing that. The scammers are on me like a rash trying to get me to yeah. hand over my Coinbase details. <laughs> Any sign of Coinbase? No. Right? So that's an example of a business that's clearly dysfunctional. Yeah. And failing, you can see it from their stock price. You know, they absolutely do not care. They can't care. They can't even look after a good customer because yeah. they are, they haven't got, they don't care. And therefore, their product's poor. And therefore, their execution's weak. Yeah. And therefore, 
ultimately, unless you know a company like that changes its ways, it's doomed. Look at Binance, they're lightning, they're on the button. And you know, the difference between that company and that company, mm -hmm. it's just you know, it's just totally, totally perfect example of a company that is failing and a company that's you know pretty much unstoppable. Okay, yeah. So it's about caring and being committed to your product, isn't it? You, you're right. Well, you know, that's all. That's all you got. That's yeah. your product. That's yeah. it. Nothing else. You know, your customer service team that's set up so that they that no one has to take it at any you know and do any work apart from you have to be on the call average of seven point five seconds, and you've got to deal with thirty two people within the day or whatever their metrics are. We run our business by metrics. Yeah, and then what happens? You have the yeah. world's worst customer service. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, um, I don't know anybody who's watching this podcast that won't say, isn't it awful? Isn't it awful? I can ring up my phone provider, my cable TV people, my electricity guys, my, whatever it is, and you're on the damn phone for two hours listening to the world's worst music. Yeah. I mean, it, it was oh, funny. Uh, yeah, no, I actually, I completely agree with that. I hate the stupid music when you dial up to the bank and it's just all oh, well the, the, there's oh, there's oh. one i had recently which the music was so appalling yeah it, i mean it, it made you know um baby shark seem like it was you know <laughs> and it was loud people. and and jarry and and sent over a, a, a low killer buck <laughs> a bit rate so it was very spiky and trebly and loud and nasty yeah <laughs> oh my god like on a, like a three second loop, and you have to, you have to wait there for thirty minutes. So it's clearly trying to get you off the line. Yeah, it's like how do you how do you have a business like that? Yeah, or how do you expect it to sense. be respected or used or or for it to grow? And funny enough, this one that's that's suffering drastically from from um its business model. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that insight, Glenn. How did you get into cryptocurrency? Because obviously you're in that space at the moment. So where about? Well, it's, it's, it's a longish road, actually. <clears throat> I mean, firstly, um, obviously Bitcoin is quite interesting. Uh, many, many moons ago in a galaxy far away, mm. uh, uh, someone was saying, oh, this is a Silk Road thing happening. It's really interesting. Da, 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 da. Mm. And I thought, well, I'll go and have a look at Silk Road. I mean, you know, Tor and all that lot. You know, you've got to keep up with the sharpest odds and stuff. So I've got Tor, which is horribly slow that I haven't been like for years, but and then I was looking around Silk Road and there was these people selling Bitcoin. Right. I think actually I went on Silk Road because I wanted to buy some Bitcoin. Right. Okay. And, and because it was a new thing and I like all the latest news thing. I love gadgets and things like that. So I go on, blooming thing was seventy dollars a coin. Oh. Th you know, I, I thought I'd go on, I'll buy myself a million of them. I didn't expect them to be seventy dollars a coin. I went, what? Seventy dollars a coin? You've got to be kidding me! Wow, I'd only be, you know, I'd be buying a few under. That's not, that, that's no fun. I want a big bag of them, like penny shares, you know. Yeah. So anyway, I didn't buy any, and I, I was interested to see that people were selling cash, which I thought was an issue. Well, that's interesting. When you go to areas like that, it's not recommended to stick around for long, but it's very interesting to see what's going on, just to see what the what that world was is like. I mean. I, I've written a number of crime, uh, crime shows, and yeah. it's always good to understand that world so you don't accidentally fall there first into it for a start, you know, yeah. or, or it doesn't come come a calling. Hello, I'm very nice to meet you. We have some very interesting business deals we'd like to do with you. You know, it's, just, it's always good to have a good full picture of everything going on. So, anyway, I came off that. I thought, well, yeah, that's interesting. And then about nine months later, I was in a cab, and the cab driver said, oh, you know what, I, I've been following this, you've been following this Bitcoin stuff. And I said, yeah, a little bit. He said, oh, well, you know, I got um, I got some of that. When it all started, I thought it was quite good. And and, and I, I forgot all about it. And anyway, I, I remember, it's, it's going on, you know, it's going on. Yeah. But I had a look at it, got 90 grand's worth of it. Oh, it's amazing. And I thought, well, that's interesting. But obviously, that's the top of the market when the cab driver tells you about it. Yeah, so yeah. A year or two passed, and I thought, well, this thing's still going. This is this is ridiculous. This is a bubble. So I wrote an article saying Bitcoin is a bubble. Yeah. And, and then I came back about three months later and went, well, oh, completely got that one wrong. This is this is amazing. And then that was about 2016. Right. And so I then started acquiring and acquiring and acquiring and acquiring. And then it blew up in, in 18. And I went, right, 
Thank you, boy. Sold it and left. But obviously, it's it's the thing that's happened. I mean, in markets, never believe the hype. In fact, when everybody wants to buy, sell it. And then everybody wants to sell, buy it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, up it went. How I got. Got, thank you very much. Kaching, nice. A few houses in that one. And turned um, online over to that idea because it's clearly a, a monster. Yeah. You know, that had been unleashed because, I mean, you're 18, I'd be patronizing that son. Um, the thing is, you will see in life, life is full of gatekeepers. Yeah. And most of those gatekeepers are dogs in a manger, which if you break unpack that metaphor, it's it, the dog that sits in the in the feed bin of an animal and won't get out and let the animal feed unless you pay it. Yeah. And those middlemen, they they they're creaming everything all the blooming time, right? They're just taking slices. Yes. So the speed that you can do stuff with, the round time in the game, becomes longer and longer and longer because they gum up the works entirely. Mm. And Blockchain, one of its its great strengths and also its weakness is that it delays these middlemen, disintermediates, okay. which is what the internet was meant to do in the first place. So this disintermediation, of course, the thing about lots of other technologies is that nobody gets it. It doesn't really impinge on them. It's it's parallel. But this goes straight to the heart of a lot of people whose job it is is to sit between you and what you want and charge you to get through the door. Mm. Right, so obviously they go, oh, bloody hell. Oh, they won't need me, man. As the lawyer said, I'm your lawyer. How can I make your life more difficult? Mm. Yeah. It, it gets rid of that. Smart yeah. contracts. Don't need laws for smart contracts. The code is the law and all that stuff. Currency, private sector money, as opposed to public sector money, it kind of goes straight to the heart of a lot of things that gum up the works. You know, you buy a gallon of petrol, you pay ten pounds. So only two pounds of that is the petrol. Yeah. Eight pounds of that is the middle. Right. Okay. And, and so on and so on and so on. And all those, I mean, the one wondrous thing about crypto exchanges, there are thousands of them, or worth thousands. There's only like thirty in the world that are equity exchanges. Why are there so few equity exchanges that do the job so way less well as yeah. the buy? And a Coinbase and a tiny little nobody bibbly bobbly exchange in the middle of nowhere. How can they do a better job of doing a, a asset exchange than the London Stock Exchange itself or the NICE or the NASDAQ? Well, they don't have to deal with acres of middlemen, acres of, of, of gatekeepers that gum up the works. Yeah, they could just go, oh, I'll write some code, here's an exchange, bang, here's a unit swap, that cost us a few hundred thousand to make that. And bang, it's worth billions, right? Because crypto takes out those gummers up of the works. When I was a long time ago, no, 2000, there was a book by Bill Gates called Business of the Speed of Light. And somehow the internet was going to take out all the grit and gravel out of the system. And it would be this marvelous lubricated thing that would whiz up and speed. You could start a business and 10 minutes later you could be in business. Mm. You try it. It's never been harder to start a business. It's gummed up with this and gummed up with that and AML and KYC and and this and that law and this out you know red tape to the to the moon yeah mm -hmm. yeah so it's got way worse since then yeah. but crypto addresses a lot of that could address a lot of that could absolutely you know take out massive chunks of these gatekeepers these parasites these these barnacles. And of course, that's massive because somebody, some country will take it on board, will yeah. adopt it, and they will crush the economies of those that don't. I mean, if you go back long enough mm. to, let's say, um, the Mediterranean right. in the 15th century, 16th century, around there, Venice was the superpower of Europe. And the reason it had the galley, and it would row around, and its battleships were row, were galleys, you know, like Ben Hur galleys, you know, you and um, they dominate. So along came people and said, ah, galleys, yeah, yesterday stuff. You want these sailing ships. They're much better. They're faster. They go further. They're great. Yeah. I mean, you've got, got to be kidding me. That's no good in battle, is it? No. You know, I can turn around on a dime. I can ram the side on here. 
you know, forget it. Same as shit. Forget it. They've been going there since the Blooming Pharaoh. They're rubbish. They are. They're rubbish. Yeah. That technology. And of course, now, because of that, Venice is no longer a Mediterranean superpower. It's just a city with a damp problem. Yeah. Because the same shit put them out of business. Yeah. Yeah. And if you then you move on a couple of hundred years, you've got Louis, Louis the 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, all that. And they had a great system going. There would be lords and there would be the king and they had all this land and they would, um, you know, peasants would do the work. The average peasant in France lived um, a shorter life than the average American slave. That's that hard for the peasants. Well, they had it all worked out. And the, and the, and the lords and the, and, the, and the dukes and all that lot had it all. And then along came the Industrial Revolution. And they went, hmm, oh, don't like these steam engines and all this smoke and burning stuff. We like hunting and fishing and shooting and farming. We don't want any of that. So they, they weren't very happy with the Industrial Revolution apart from the Germans and the British. Mm. So they had a revolution which was set off by the industrial class. And the king ended it up with his head on the stick, which was bad news for him. But for yeah. France, France had 30 million people before the French Revolution. They've now got 60. Britain right. had 6 million people before the um, French Revolution, and they've got 60 million people. And the Germans, they liked industry, and so did the British. What happened to the French? They got crushed for the next two centuries because they didn't embrace technology. And Bitcoin and crypto is such a technology that if you don't actually embrace it, the people that do embrace it will crush you economically. And that's right. coming up next. I probably You'll see it. I probably won't. But you'll, you'll be my age. You'll be seeing that old guy. He's sexy to that. And there he is. Yeah. No, I definitely need to start getting more clued up with crypto and all that because I've really... Well, it'll be on another big bull run in oh, 18 months or two years. Right. And it'll go 10x. So a little bit of money um, in there will serve you well. But remember, when it goes to the moon, well, it won't actually meet the moon. It will go into orbit. You've got, you've got to bail out at that point. Yes. You've got yeah. to do a boom garden and bail out with your parachute and get back in on, on planet Earth. No. Because it will go up like a rocket and down like a rocket. It's, it's bound to be a repeating pattern. So how do you, like, time it? So like, how do you know if it's too bubbly and you want to get Well, started? you don't. And What I did last time um, was... I was seen at about five, six thousand mm. of, of Bitcoin. And I'm thinking, well, it's gonna, gonna kind of repeat the process. It's gonna go to 20, 30, 40, 40,000 I've had in mind. So I'm gonna get out about 38. So it goes ballistic and I'm it's at 33 and it's thrashing around and oh dear, and, you know, you're sitting on a <laughs> five, six X. Yeah. And, you know, and you're sweating. Oh so I, I put my orders in at thirty-eight thousand. Right. And it was thrashing around. I thought I'm out, 34,000, gone, bang. So out I went, roughly in the round then. And, and then I thought, well, you know, the thing to do is you reduce your risk. So right. you take snap off, say, 20% of that profit, and then you go to the more risky end. So you go away from Bitcoin, and you try to find some crazy little stuff that are going to go, you know, and, and if it goes the next leg up, or just whatever it does, you're just taking some of your profit, and you're putting it on stuff that's more risky, but you're putting less on. So if you lose it, you go, oh, well, that's, oh, well. Um, and you're not crying that you lost it all again. And then if it goes ballistic like the other lot did, I, Bitcoin's going to go again. He's going to go to 100,000 or 60,000. That, the crazy stuff, won't just double. It will go up tenfold. Right. So you, you've got like 20% of what you've got with an upside of another 10x rather than 100. And that's exactly what happened, fortunately. So and the, um, yeah, things like Matic and Variable, um, you know, so they, I, I went into those and they just did extremely well. So but what you're doing, forget the names, is you're managing your risk. So you're in it at the bottom of, of Bitcoin. The only choice right. you've got to make is, do you reckon it's going to go up or not? You know, do you know in your heart of hearts that this is going to be big? Yes. Right. So there you are. In at the bottom, everyone's going, oh, woe is me. I bought 20, you know, it's three. And, oh. and you don't care. Right? And in fact, you buy more. You just don't yeah, care. Yeah. Because remember, you want to buy when everyone else wants to sell. And it's even better when everyone else has already sold. Yes. And they're just saying, oh, it's the end of the world. It's going to go down more because I'm out and I've got room. It's oh, so when else is full. You're buying there. And then away it goes. No one goes, oh, what the hell's going on there? What? what, 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 what. And then suddenly they get FOMO and pile in. And when the FOMO is a pile in, you want to be piling out. Yes. Yeah? Because you don't need to get the top. I mean, you can, but, you know, what, what do they say? Um, 
uh, bears get fed, pigs get slaughtered, or bulls get fed, pigs get slaughtered. <clears throat> so, so you just and you go. Now I can't sleep at night. Well, you you want to get out. If you can't sleep at night, you should sell. It doesn't matter if it's going to go up more. You just you've had enough. There's yeah. always the next one, and there's always the next. And particularly when you're you know eighteen, if you, you can you can say I'm going to take ten years to learn how to do this problem. And I'm going to do it with small amounts. I'm just going to build them up in small amounts. And I'm going to play around with it. I'm going to find where I can play around with it. But with real money. Crypto is good for that because you can go so small. Equities is, you know, you need to be moving in at least £1,000 on lumps, which is a lump, right? It's a lump when you start it. But crypto, it could be a £5. Yeah, but you get the feel of the, the, the ebb and flow of things. You train yourself up. So you're 30 now. And now you have got a grand or two to start pushing about. And then you're 40. You can Pushing about 15, 20, 25 grand now. Well, with inflation, it'd probably be million. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's how you build it up. And by the time you're old and like me, you're a critical old veteran and you've got a huge part of that. So, so, would you advise someone of my age getting into this space? Absolutely. Yeah. The earlier, the better. Oh, absolutely. You're late. And like, anything particular or? It's a skill game. Mm. It's an absolute skill game. So it's just like you were teaching yourself how to play chess or teach yourself how to play poker. It's a skill game. If you're gambling, you're going to lose. If you're if you're playing, you're going to win. Yeah. So it, it's it's like the market will pay you in the currency you want to be paid. And if you want to be paid in fun, you won't get so much money. If you want to be paid in status, you won't make so much money. If you want to be if you want to be part of a of, of a crowd, you won't make much money. If you just want to get paid in cash from profits. And you diligently play that market. I don't know how that but you di- diligently invest. You will make a lot of money because most people aren't doing that. Most people are fixated by the gambling aspect of it all. Yeah, no. And what would be your like three best bits of advice you'd give to any beginner looking to invest in crypto? In crypto, um, play small, very very small. Yeah. Don't believe anything or anybody. Yeah. Mm. If you think you know, you don't. If you know, you know, you do. Mm. Now, I, I, I learned that off a of gold mine. Right. I was up to me, up to me, nipples in a river. And he said, if you, oh, actually, means, but never mind, it's not so much fun saying it that way. When you're panning it, if you think you've got a bit of gold in your pan, you haven't. And when you know you've got a bit of gold in your pan, you haven't. If you think it's gold, it isn't. If you know it's gold, it is. And people go, what does it mean? If you know, if you think. But you know when you know. Yes, yeah. And if you think you know, you go, ee, ee. no. And when you go, ah, ha, ha, then, then that's right. And, you know, that is always a good test of anything you do. If you think it's good, it isn't. And if you know it's good, it is. It's just that, you know, it's love at first sight. It's equivalent. You just know. Oh, you think, oh, you think, oh, yeah, it's that. And, uh, you're, oh. And that's the same with the investments or, or with anything really in, in life is that you know when you know it, it doesn't come very often. Yeah. And when you're starting out, you definitely got to have passed that test. And it's a skill game, it's a single player game. Yeah. You, you have to get good tools, you have to realize you're up, up against interesting um, competition. Yeah. And you just got to take it, you just got to build up the skill, your skill level by it's work. For me, it's not work, I love it. Yeah. I love it. It's, it's like fun, you know. But but if it can be fun, if you can if it can be fun for you for financial reasons rather than for the fact that you're on some community going, oh, we're going to push the price of AMC to the moon. If you steer clear of that stuff and mm-hmm. just do it as as a as a as a mental task, like chess, yeah. and you'll do it exceptionally well because most people are just doing it for all the wrong reasons in all the wrong possible ways without any thought or practice or anything it's just they're just lambs to the slaughter but you don't have to be. yeah you really don't it's not would that difficult re- actually. it's not that difficult would you recommend um anything in particular for people to actually get clued up with it like how did you initially start did you read books about it did you read magazines what was it you can't know too much mm. you can't know too much and as i said the the level of of thought that people put into this stuff the level of of effort and work they put into it is very low mm. so if you were if you spent i mean 
you can say, I mean, do you watch television? A little bit, not too much. So if you spend all the time you spend on television, on an open university course, you'd have that degree in about two years. Yes. Yeah. So it's the same with anything. I mean, you know, by the time you're 30, you could have 10 degrees. You could be a professor on the time you spend watching television. Yep. Right? And and people never go, oh, bloody hell, what a great idea. I'm going to do that. They go, oh, I like my television. I do watch the sport, though. Yeah. Relaxation. Yeah. And I'm sorry to all those, all those people watching this. They go, yeah, that's me. That's me. I like my football. I like my relaxation. It's true. I don't it's want true. to be a professor. Yeah. No, 100%. So, because yeah. you're an aspirational podcast, aren't you? So, so you're pushing out to people that they can achieve. Yeah, and they need to put in the time to make it happen, essentially. Yeah, work. Work hard, yeah. But I've got good news. It's only work if you don't want to do it. If mm. you actually want to do it, it's actually leisure. Yeah. yeah. People get up at four in the morning and put on a small amount of clothes and a pair of training shoes, and they run around in the freezing cold for an hour. And, that, and that's what they live for yeah. because they love that yeah. running around barely naked in the freezing cold for five miles that's most people's idea of misery right but yes. for them that's their leisure because and it's not work it's their pleasure because they want to do it and they enjoy it so you know with a business if you can do something you enjoy and get paid to do it that's the best thing in the world because you, you'll be very good at it too yep no 100 percent. and with online blockchain plc did that come about because you saw opportunity within this space or what's Well, crap? yeah, absolutely, yeah. Because, I mean, online went from being an incubator of massively multiplayer online games to an incubator of internet stuff. Mm. And then it's it's now an incubator of Web3, I suppose is what they call it now. And you see, I'm so old, I just think of it as more internet and crypto. But, yeah. yes, it's now incubating that. It's doing the same thing as it's always done. Uh, and, you know, every now and again, you get a big win. And yeah. we're hoping that we've got that with, with our bridge, which is called Umbria. And and that's something that we've, we hope that's our, you know, the follow on from what we did with ADBFN. And hopefully much better because, you know, it's crypto, it's global and, and it's, you know, incredibly powerful. More than just a community of people that um, following such shares. So so is Umbria the same model as ADVFN? No, or- not at all. No, it's, it, it, it's, you know, 20 years have passed. Right. Uh, it, it, it's no longer a. Uh, I mean, the beautiful thing about um, the way that crypto is is its decentralized nature. Yeah. And again, it, it's a blessing and a curse. So if you can actually track the positive benefits for that and eliminate the negatives of mm-hmm. that, you, you've got a very, very good um, place to go from. Because what a lot of people don't realize, it's all well and good taking opportunities, but also avoiding the things that will hurt you is uh, just as powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in an extent, you can be, I mean, it happens to entrepreneurs a lot. Mm. They're highly successful. They buy themselves a light aircraft and they kill themselves. Yeah. You'll read that time and time again. Guy crashes his helicopter, guy crashes his airplane or wraps his Bentley around a tree. Happens over and over again because they grab opportunities and they're very good at that, but actually maybe not good at minimizing their risk. Mm. And, And therefore, that's what bites them because mismanagement of risk can hurt you as much as um, correct management of opportunity can help. So there is just as much to be made from not making losses Mm -hmm. as there are from actually making profits because a a, a negative loss is a profit. Yeah. If you want to do the math. Yeah, no, that's a great bit bit of advice to be fair, um, Clem. Um, I just wanted to track back to um, online blockchain. You said it's an incubator. Can you just elaborate on that? Um, well, okay. The way an incubator works is that it has an idea, or okay. someone else has an idea, uh, but normally it has an idea, and it gets a team together and says, "This could be yours. We'll fund it, and we want this piece." But ah, okay, yeah. Or someone will come to us with a team. It's very rare that happens, uh, and say, "Oh, we want to do this," and 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 we fund oh, it. We've done that before. Okay, I see. But you know, it's like someone has already laid in it. Maybe us. Uh, and we help patch it out and grow. You know, we give it a nice environment to get. I going. see. Right. Uh, but it, it's a very, it's a very tricky um, way of doing things. Very, very tricky, particularly with young people who who are in a hurry, and um, yeah. often in you know ridiculously fast hurry, and and make all sorts of um, miscalculations. 
Yeah. And what's your long-term vision with the company? With, with online blockchain? Well, yeah. I, think, I think it's got a good opportunity to um, do with what it's already got and really well. And so I think now I'm an old man. Um, I think, you know, I think the next five to 10 years should be a period where it can grow its its incubatees to a, an exit for everybody. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so you're basically, so is it for people starting companies within the crypto space and then you're, you said you're providing the right. Well, we're, we're, yeah, we're more, we're more inventing them ourselves, coming up with an idea, oh, okay. and finding the people to do it. Oh, okay. And, you know, it, it, it's almost like, like. It's kind of venture capital, really. But, you know, we, over the years, we, we found everybody loves our ideas more than anybody else, does, after all. So mm -hmm. it's a natural tendency to have your own ideas. And so many people's ideas uh, are 4 a.m. thoughts when they wake up in a sweat or their great grandson says, Oh, you should be doing this, you know, that grand dad. Um, so often, you know, it, you find out the ideas aren't so hot. And again, it's not just about the ideas. You can have brilliant ideas. Execution is really, 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 really tough. So you need yeah. to find people that can do the execution. And and so in the end, you end up putting all the pieces together yourself and and then incubating it. That's a, that's a very self-aware thing to do, isn't it? Understanding, putting the right team together. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, putting teams together is, is, is actually quite fun. Yeah. It can be frustrating when you ring someone up and say, hey, remember me? Do you want to come do this? They go, no. Oh, you should. It's good, you know. But you know, that's 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 something that I've learned over, over recent. You know, yeah. Recently, I'm still trying to learn, um, and that is there's the sales end of it, which you always think is incredibly important. But the back, the reverse side of that coin, which is equally as important, is hiring people. Yes. And nobody, nobody in an organisation wants to hire. Because yeah. they, they hate hiring somebody that's as smart as they are because it might put them out of the job in their in their minds. B, they hate having to turn a lot of people down. Mm. You know, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't get the job. They hate that. And then they hate the fact that they're probably going to have to fire these people because only two out of three will work. Yeah. So they hate they hate the whole hiring process. Yeah. No. So mm -hmm. that is a real can be a real lag on business. Yes. Yeah. That or they hire their mate. Or they hire somebody who's rubbish, so they're not threatened in, in their own role, and so on and so forth. So the hiring part it is a very, very, very important part of it because people generally within organisation don't don't want to do it. Mm. So you know, team building is actually quite quite a, a a skill and quite a valuable thing if you can do it. What what are the key things that you look for in talent then? I call it magic pixie dust. I mean, you've clearly, you've clearly got it because, you know, you're on the other end of the Zoom call, you're, you know, you're only just hatched and there you are getting this business together. I mean, that's brilliant. Why are you doing it when you're 18 when most people are smoking weed and, and you know, <laughs> where, where, where the next raid is? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, but nobody, I take it, that, you know, nobody taught you how to do this. Nobody said go do it. And if they had, you probably wouldn't have done it, but you've gone and done it yourself. Or if, if I'd asked, um, 100 17 year olds to go and start a podcast they wouldn't do it or if they did do it they do it half-heartedly they wouldn't do it properly and mm. and you know I, I was just you know don't, wouldn't be able to find someone to ring around loads of people and send out all those emails blah, 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 to get it all set up and all the stuff that you've had to do and achieve you might say well it's not that difficult really but mm. did you say that no i um well i mean yeah, I mean everything that I've achieved so far is not much, but I'm like, putting myself out there. It's yeah, it's not much, right? You didn't have to crack the riddle of the Sphinx, did you? No. You didn't have to untie the Gordian knot. All you had to right. do was put your pants on and exactly. get going. Show up. That's what it is. Show up, absolutely. That is, I mean, that's Woody Allen. But ninety yeah. percent of success is just showing up. It's not true because lots of people show up every day at their job. Mm. And they bloody well hate it, and they bloody well don't do it. Mm. Yeah, showing up and wanting to show up, yeah, and and having the magic pixie dust, which is to actually, you know, hey, hey I'm here, <laughs> and I've made it happen, and it didn't seem very difficult to me. Why does not Why doesn't anybody do it? The point is, you've got the drive, and um, strength and drive, right? Yeah. Most people can put their failure down to weakness. Yeah. Yeah, and it's often 
I'm going to be old fashioned now, moral weakness. And they just haven't got the gumption. There's loads of old words for it gumption, and more gumption. Mm -hmm. right? You've got to have gumption. Or you've got, because people, it's amazing. I, I've been to innumerable cash point machines and I've never seen money poking out the slot. Yeah, neither yeah, I've never seen it. Although it does happen occasionally because the machines take them back after a certain amount of time. <laughs> but I've never seen it, right? Yeah. And the point is that somehow when it comes to the other way, mm. it doesn't work out like that. Oh. Yeah. And you, you can do it if you really want to. And you really want to and you've done it. Most people do not have the drive to really yeah. want to do it. Yeah, and yeah. ultimately, you, you could do this um, chat better than I did. You've gone out there and said it wasn't too difficult, just a matter of putting yourself putting yourself out there, which translates means putting a bit, in a bit of effort, being yeah. reliable, making sure you're consistent, making sure you've got a good product, making yeah. sure you've got the computer and the camera all set up and the microphone working, making sure you've got somewhere to save that file out to, make sure you've got somewhere to upload it to, make sure you've got somewhere that's going to pay you. Where are you monetize, by the way? Uh, when when will we monetize? Oh, are you monetizing? Where no, we're not. We're not monetized right now. Um, there's a certain number of subscribers you have to reach on YouTube and views before you can properly monetize. But we're growing. Very we're difficult. Growing. Very difficult to get monetized. Yeah. On YouTube because they throttle you out. So bear that in mind. No, and definitely. They, they yeah. will. They will keep you down. So that's very hard. So you have to use other channels. I think that's a great point to um, wrap up on, uh, Clem. Uh, thank you very much for copying on the podcast. Um, before you go, though, I have got one more question that I just want to ask you, and that's um, just a bit of general investing advice, um, aside from cryptocurrency. Can't give advice, but maybe I'll be able to help answer the question. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, but what would you say is your single top tip um, for any investor out there? Ooh, single best top tip. Um, well, actually, it has to be something quite simple. People would be told this all the time, which is do your own research. Yep. Okay. Because, you know, at the end of the day, there's nothing, there's no fun making money off someone else's tips. And there's there's nothing but pain losing money off mm -hmm. someone else's tips. And, you know, if, you, if you've had a learning experience, you've paid for it, which, you know, most people don't mind paying for to learn is what university is these days so you know if you lose money you should be able to learn a, a lesson from that and it's cost you so that's not so bad and if you make money from your own um, skill it's not even better yeah no 100 percent. that's a great bit of advice um and yeah as i said great point to wrap up on uh thank you very much for hopping on the podcast clem um really enjoyed it hope you did too and um we wish you wish you all the best luck with you know, your future ventures and with um, the stuff you're doing with online blockchain. Do you want if to I just end up for you, please subscribe to this channel and please like it and please put a comment down because that is the way this guy gets more people like me for you to listen to. So please subscribe and like. Please ring the bell. You know you need to. You know you must. You know you have to.